Hey everyone, welcome back to week four of Striper Season Updates with On The Water. I'm Matt Hefner, and over the course of April, May, and June, I'm going to be following the bite as the stripers migrate north. We'll bounce around the coast and talk to captains, shop owners, anglers, and more as we give you the scoop on what's happening and where. With the first push of the migration well underway, we are finally seeing liced up schoolies hit the south shores of Martha's Vineyard. In last week's video, I talked to Captain Stavros Viglas. Stavros spent his winter nights targeting big holdover bass in the salt ponds around Martha's Vineyard, up to 23 pounds. That's a fish that's eaten good in the winter. Despite the schoolies' arrival on the south shores of Martha's Vineyard, Stavros hasn't seen much in terms of bait. And even though he was out there catching the first liced up schoolies, it'll only be a matter of time before those schoolies get pushed out of there by a larger migratory body of fish. Let's head on down to my home waters of New York and check in with Kevin Ryan. Kevin spends his time targeting big bass from the seat of a kayak in New York's most turbulent waters in what's known as the New York Bite. The New York Bite's an area of water surrounding New York City and including New York City's New York Bay, aka New York Harbor, which can have some pretty treacherous waters. But the mouth of the Hudson River, as we all know, is one of the best places to get on big bass, especially this time of year during the spring migration. All right, this week I'm talking to Kevin Ryan. He fishes the greater New York City area in what's known as the New York Bite. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be back after the, uh, the kayak article that you just did. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a pleasure having you work on that piece with us. If you haven't read that piece, it's in the March issue of On the Water magazine. Check it out. So, you know, how long have you been kayak fishing? I've been in, I've been in the kayak now. It's got to be approaching seven years. Seven years now. Never looked back. I was going to say, as soon as you start getting out into that deeper water and you can access water that you just can't reach from the, from the surf, it's, it's probably just game over. Exactly. You're on the shore, you're looking out and you see the birds working and there's no possible way you're ever getting into that. You know, I said, I got it. I have to get out there. I can't sit on this beach anymore. I grew up fishing here. Uh, it started, geez, I was probably about 10 years old. My, my uncle at the time brought me uh, to a local set of piers, which would be in the St. George area, which are no longer there. And I just remember we had a basket on the line and we're fishing out of a hand hole on a pier and the fish couldn't fit through it. And that was it. That, that set things up for me. I couldn't believe there was a fish that big that couldn't fit through this little hand hole. You know, it was just, and that set me on fire and it's been ever since then. So figure I've been fishing these waters for easy 45 years now. So would you kind of describe, you know, what the New York bite, uh, and that's B I G H T not bite like a bite of pizza or anything. Um, but the New York bite, can you describe kind of what that is uh, to people who might not be from, you know, the New York area? Okay, basically New York bite, it's like you're in urban environment, you're out there fishing amongst people who have no idea, you know, whether you're on a pier, launching the kayak, you let the people know, you know, what goes on out there. People don't realize the fishery we have in and around New York City, Staten Island, Brooklyn, the whole New York area, really quite a good fishery. And now a week after New York's opening day, how would you describe the fishing conditions uh, and the quality of fish around the New York Bight area? Man, the, the fishing's really blown up with better, much bigger quality fish. I was out the other day, um, I had nothing under 30 inches, fish up to 43 inches. Um, it's really blown up. Last week, yeah, I was out two days ago, we had a bunch of schoolie bass show up, but if you weeded through those, the reward was much bigger fish up to 40 inch. Um, I'm heading out tonight, so I'll let you know what happens after that. It should be a good, good night. Yeah, it's awesome. Right after that full moon, uh, we were saying that full moon is really going to kick things off, especially, uh, you know, heading up at, we had our first migratories off of, uh, the South side of, um, Martha's Vineyard last week, we were talking to Stavros Viglas. So hopefully that's pushing some more, you know, bigger fish through your region and pushing the schoolies up to us with that full moon. Yeah, you can have the schoolies. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, we'll take the schoolies right now, man. I'm, I I moved up here from New York. I've been waiting a couple extra weeks than I'm used to, to, to get on some bass. So, so Kevin, what are some of the tactics, like you were saying, that you use to get through those schoolie bass and into the bigger fish? Now that you have bigger fish moving through your region, uh, like you said, up to 43 inches, how do you weed through the schoolie bass and get into those bigger guys? Okay, basically, what I'll do is I'll go out and I'm always always have a split screen with down scan, side scan, looking left, right. When I find a pile of fish, I'll back off from them. I'll cast a, a jig and shad at them. Sort of like that one ounce jig, 5.5 shad, just to, just to rule out what's down there and what's chewing. Um, I'll do a bottom bounce, very, very slow retrieve. It's pretty much finesse fishing like you'd find the freshwater guys doing. 
and the fish respond great to this tactic. The fish just bang it right off. Once you locate them, you get a bottom bounce for the bigger ones. If it's bright, sunny days, they're going to be on the ground hiding from the sun, but they will, they will react to that bait on the bottom. I've had 40 inch fish hit it on a dead stick. Okay. So when you're jigging on the bottom like that, are you usually looking for moving water? Uh, basically I'm fishing, uh, on the edges of flats. Like it'll come up out of the, out of the, uh, channel 50, 20 and on a 20 foot flat, I'll find the fish sitting on that ledge. And I just, fire at them and pick away and see what kind of quality I have there. If they're small fish, I move on to another batch. And that side scan, that's got to really come in handy, especially in New York. Um, when you got really turbulent waters, um, you know, it's not always easy, especially even on a glassy day in New York waters to spot fish on the surface. Oh, it's a big key to my success in finding stripers and, you know, locating exactly where they are, whether it's 20 feet from the boat up to 80 foot out, I can scan them. Yeah, that's that's remarkably useful. I've never had that luxury on my kayak yet, but uh, that's that's soon to come for sure. Yeah, I highly recommend. Side scan will change the way you fish, guaranteed. Absolutely. And and what uh, r- remind me, what kind of kayak are are you in, and and like how do you outfit it? Okay, right now I'm in a, a 20, 2020 Pro Angler three sixty. Um, I use a Simrad unit, Go Nine with side scan, uh, Torquedo to get me in and out. You know, I will pedal, you know, uh, for trolling and uh, locate fish. The trolling helps a lot. I know, you know, around the New York bite area, those flutter spoons are real popular. I was talking to John Oswald about that a couple of weeks ago. um, And I know that they're, you know, real popular at, you know, attack watermen. Where can you maybe even get your hands on some of those around New York City? Uh, Around New York City, I'd say hit up uh, what's it's a new shop here. It's a big dog bait and tackle on Midland Avenue in Staten Island. Um. This is the key, you know, pick your color, white, green, silver. It's lights out fishing. It really is really something spectacular. I vertical jig them the same as, uh, same as all the guys on the boats. Vertical jig, it's savage bite. It really is. Uh, uh, What have you been seeing in terms of bait around there? I mean, you're, you obviously there's always bunker around. It seems to be, you know, the most popular bait in the beginning of the season. Yeah, we had, we did have herring. Bunker has been kind of scarce. Uh, I was out on Monday and we finally got bunker. We had decent pods show up. So it's really going to, really going to turn the bite on. And spoons will be, they'll be keyed in on spoons. Uh, also big metal lips. Nice. Okay. I was going to, I was actually going to ask you about that. So I have this ba- uh, back bay plugs metal lip here. And I've trolled it from my kayak a few times and I've never actually had a hookup on it, believe it or not. But man, I like, I like to fish at night and something like this, you know, it's got the treble underneath. It's got a treble right here. And then you got this one single hook on the back. Yeah. Same as, same as this is same maker back bay plugs. Bobby makes a a killer plug. He really does. Just, I've caught tons of fish on his stuff. Makes a quality product. For, for metal lips, they're the most productive to troll when you're on a kayak. Because I, I would imagine you don't do much casting with a metal lip on a kayak. Yeah, that's trolling. Uh, my troll speed is usually 1.5, two knots tops. I try to stay in that in that area. And I, I'll even hold the rod at times and just give it a snap once in a while. And believe it or not, that second pause, the, the bass, will they'll jump right on it. You mentioned you use a motor as well. Um, so, I mean, how important is that to successfully kayak fishing in New York waters? Because you talk a little bit about it in the kayak fishing piece. Um, and I know just from being on boats out in those waters that they get choppy a lot of the time just from the amount of boat traffic. So, you know, h- how much is does that help and how effective is it in, in trolling? Uh, in trolling, it's great because it, it, you'll maintain your speed. If you set it at 1.5, you know, once the wind and the current, you're set at 1.5, your legs aren't going to give out. You're dialed in. It's one steady speed. And you can always turn the rudder, give that plug a little twitch, and the fish really turn on it. And so what kind of conditions have you seen so far this year like that have been the most productive for bass? I mean, I find cloudy days and heavy wind to be the most productive, but that's not always you know, the ideal conditions for being out in a kayak. So what, what do you find to be the most productive conditions for spring bass fishing? My most productive days are overcast. I love an overcast day. People think I'm nuts. Like a day like today, it's beautiful, blue sky. I hate it. I won't go out. 
you know, unless unless it's really flat, then I'll go out and pick away with fish off the bottom. Uh, is there a, a list of gear or a safety gear and a checklist that you take with you or that you make sure you check off every time you get in the yak? Uh, of course, PFD. Um, I'm a big advocate of having a dry suit right now. Yes, you're going to get days in the 70s, 75. Yes, it's going to be hot, but the water is 48 to 50 something degrees. Uh, you're not going to last long in that. Um, basically I let somebody know where I'm going. Uh, I never give them a return time because it could be four hours. It could be 12 hours, you know, but, uh, always give a, always give a plan, always PFD invest in a dry suit. It's a lot cheaper than a funeral. I have my VHF radio. Um, and I always have my phone. The phone is in a waterproof case. I try not to take it out at all. So, you know, I get a lot of missed calls, but if I need it, it's there, you know? You have to have a backup besides the radio. Things fail, you know. I, I can tell you take a lot of pictures while you're out there. How do you get your pictures without uh, without taking the phone out of the bag? Or or do you have like a GoPro camera set up? I have an Olympus waterproof, shockproof camera I bring out with me. And that gets, that gets all my pictures. I'm going to start. I have GoPros. I just don't like to use them. It reveals a little too much for my liking. Well, I'll teach you a couple of tricks because uh, I, I used to think the same thing. And it turns out I had the wide angle set setting on. So you can change the uh, camera angle to kind of crop out, you know, certain stuff. So I'll, I'll teach you a couple of GoPro tricks to, you know, to save yourself from that. Awesome. Appreciate that. So because you've been around New York for so long, obviously you, you probably have an idea of there's this body of fish that just kind of hunkers down in Jamaica Bay pretty much all year round. And they move back and forth between the Hudson and New York Harbor and maybe even Raritan Bay a little bit, but it doesn't seem that they really go anywhere else. They're really localized to New York's back bays and New Jersey and Staten Island, things like that. So um, how do you tell when you've gotten, you've gotten on the first migratory fish of the year? I mean, is there another sign you look for besides sea lice? Uh, basically sea lice. That's my, that's my key to it. If they've had those sea lice, they had fresh fish, they've coming out, they're coming around the hook, they're coming in, you know, the uh, resident fish, you're not going to find that. And do you find any sort of different behaviors between the resident schoolie, like the resident schoolie size bass and the, uh, the migratory schoolie bass? I would say the, the ones that come in, the migratory bass, they fight a hell of a lot harder. Those fresh ocean fish, they fight a whole bunch whole bunch better yeah they'll pull a little bit more it seems like whereas the holdovers are almost uh just a bit more of a of heavy weight yeah they kind of just lay down like oh again you know but <laughs> yeah right i i like when the fresh fish come in you know can you talk a little bit about how you know you have your you have an instagram page tog candy jigs and you make your own handmade hand poured jigs um why did you start making your own jigs is it just because of the sheer amount of fishing you do uh basically it started as kind of a mistake. I was going to the shop and paying, buying tons of jigs and they were like four or $5 a piece. I'm buying 30 jigs at a, at a pop. I said, you know what? I have all the stuff to do this. Let me try and do my own thing. I put them up, made a few and people went crazy. Oh, how can I get them? How can I get them? I said, maybe I'm onto something here. And now it's probably going on about six years doing it and it's really blossomed and you know, I make my own jigs, pour my, pour the own jigs, color them, everything, uh, do custom colors. It's really taken off and uh, keeps me busy, but never keeps me off the water. I was going to say, it sounds like it's a product of your kayak fishing almost. You said you've been doing it about six years, you kayak fishing about seven years around New York. So it sounds like something that kind of came about because you noticed certain qualities about jigs that you maybe, you know, found more beneficial in terms of fishing. Like I know I have a couple of jig heads that I like. I don't know if I have any laying around. Oh, here we go. So these aren't kill shots, but they're just like them. Like these are some of my favorite jig heads to use because they're just heavy. They sink like a rock. The shape of them is real, you know, it, it's real, I want to say aerodynamic, but it's just perfect for the way it sinks. Um, so is there anything about your jigs that you wanted to create that would make them stand out? Uh, basically hooks. It, I'm all about hooks. It's got to be a two times strong hook. I bought many a jigs and you get a decent fish on, you bring it up and the hook is bent. Can't have that. You know, you know, as well as I do that one comes next to the kayak, one head spin and that hook bends, he's gone. Couldn't stand it anymore. So I, all my jigs come with a two times strong hook, except for fluke, you know, fluke is a standard hook, but anything bluefish, uh, 
stripers, blackfish, got to be a strong hook. So using electronics, kayak anglers have the advantage of situating themselves right above a pile of fish, um, which usually leads to a lot more catch and release. And catch and release is obviously the most popular way to fish for striped bass these days. Um, but in order to limit release mortality, how do you ensure that bigger fish get properly revived and released from the seat of a kayak? Is there any tools that you you know, must have on the seat of your kayak in, in order to release these fish appropriately? Yeah, basically I try, you know, if, I'm, if it's a good enough fish and I'm going to snap a picture, uh, get them on, get the hooks out immediately, get that picture as quick as possible, lip grip them, and then pedal with him in the water, head first into the water, get that water moving through his gills. And once he starts thrashing, open it up, let him go. You know, so some people take way too long to take a picture, you know, and the thing's sitting there for like five minutes. I'm like, throw it back. Like, it's not worth it. Just get it done. So what do you anticipate, you know, as the the rest of April progresses where we have like, you know, maybe two full weeks, I think, left of April, if that. Um, and, you know, then May is kind of a little bit different. The blue fish start to move in. You start seeing them stacked on the bottom as well with those bass. So what do you anticipate in the next two weeks to change? Two weeks, I think we're going to get a push of really big fish. Um, there's been a few reports of, you know, fish in the way up 40s, close to 50 inch fish. So that's another push of fish that hopefully didn't get blown out by the, the storm two days ago. Um, we're definitely going to be seeing those. Water temps are still 52. So the blue fish... Bluefish got about three, four weeks before hopefully we see them move in and decimate the area. <laughs> yeah, 20, 20 pound class fish are in solid. As the striped bass migration continues, how can people keep up with you and follow the migration and the bite through the New York bite area? Uh, I have uh, Instagram. It's uh, NYC Fins and Feathers. Um, you can look me up on that. Uh, also, Tog Handy Jigs on Instagram. And Facebook, I'm uh, Kevin Ryan Sr. on there. You know, you'll see some stuff you don't want to see, but I try and keep it very fishy. Oh, you got it. You're a family man, right? I mean, come on. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Kevin, and uh, hope the bite continues to heat up for you down there, man. All right, man. Be well. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Take care, man. All right, buddy. Later. That's all the time we have for this week. Thanks again to Kevin Ryan for joining us from down in New York. Hopefully you get onto a couple hammers tonight, Kevin. Being that it's now the third week in April, striped bass fishing is absolutely on fire in the New York City area. Take it from the guy who's fishing right at the mouth of the Hudson River. New Jersey's going to be seeing fish in the 40-pound range very soon. Bigger fish have moved out into the Long Island Sound, and Connecticut and Rhode Island, as well as the east end of Long Island, should expect a push of migratory fish well into the 30-inch range within the next week. Right now, it continues to be mostly holdovers from much of the Northeast. But like Captain Stavros said last week, the fish are on their way. If you haven't found the fish already, try heading out late at night. Target pockets of moving water around mussel beds and other structures that you'll find in the back bay areas. If you haven't already, sign up for On The Water's Striper Cup using the link in the description below. For more striper season updates, make sure you like and subscribe, follow us on social media at On The Water Magazine, and be sure to tune in next Friday for another striper season update from On The Water.